President Lee, fellow Rotarians and guests. Some of you may recall the last time an economist spoke to our club. It was about August last year. While he didn't have much to say on the matter of economics, but he did relate a number of rather risque jokes that did not find universal favour. Indeed, there are a number of complaints lodged with President Tony. So Tony decided to redress this perception of economists by personally inviting his own panel to address the club. However, as we all know, getting a couple of economists to agree on anything is a challenge, let alone getting three of them to share a platform and agreeing on a suitable date. Indeed, it took half the year to find a mutually agreeable date, which obviously went beyond Tony's tenure as president. <laughs> so to put this all in a professional context, we all know that accountants can do anything with numbers to balance the books or to get the right result. Lawyers have the ability to bend the facts to suit their line of argument, but economists can never come to a definitive conclusion on an issue because of their disposition for hedging their bets with the classic, on the one hand this, but on the other hand that. They like to have a bob each way on outcomes. So it is with pleasure that I invite our resident economists, Jeff Baskand, Deputy Governor and Head of Operations at the Reserve Bank, Rob Davison, Executive Director, Economic Service at Beef and Lamb New Zealand Limited, and Derek Gill, Principal Economist at NZIER, to address the club on who's afraid of the GFC and what did we learn from the Great Recession. Each will speak for approximately seven minutes each and will be led off by Derek, followed by Rob, with Jeff to have the last word. Gentlemen. Yeah, well, as economists, you know, we're great believers in competition, and as, as a panel, we've agreed not to compete. So we're going to do slightly uh, different presentations, and I just thought I'd start off by setting the scene and kind of pa painting the overall kind of macro picture for New Zealand. The first thing I say about the GFC is, um, you know, people remember the kind of broad events, but it was the biggest financial crisis the world experienced in the Great Depression, and as a professional economist, it was seriously scary. Um, you saw the collapse of a couple of very large financial institutions. You saw the bailout of a number of banks in a number of countries, not New Zealand and Australia, which we'll come to. Um, you saw the bailout of some countries because they had to bail out their banks, uh, viz Greece and Cyprus. Um, you saw incredible volatility in financial markets, the near breakdown of the payment system at various times. And that's not all, folks. Um, in, in a different um, life, I have a little bit of an interface with the security sector. And um, at one of the workshops I rang, someone said that at the time that uh, Lehman Brothers went down, which was a major, you know, that was one of the big six investment banks in Wall Street, and the feds decided not to bail it out. So it, it, it folded and people, the losses fell where the losses lay. The day after Lehman Brothers broke, I understand the Bank of America, which is the largest bank in the United States, suffered a major cyber attack originating out of China. And if that had happened, if that, and I, this isn't substantiated, I quickly Googled it and couldn't find anything on it, but if that, if that is true, and it's quite plausible, the world, I think, would be... We'd be giving a very different talk here today than the one we're giving. Because basically you would have seen the implosion of global financial capitalism. But the Bank of America opened. So what I want to talk about is where we are in a kind of a post-GFC world, where, how that's affected New Zealand, and then some closing thoughts about what it all means. And, and um, as, the, as the provenial two-handed uh, economist, um, I don't think anyone knows what it means yet. I mean, this has been an incredibly challenging and rich time. If you want a good account, um, Alan Bollard wrote an extraordinary accessible and insightful book on his experience of being a reserve bank governor on the kind of roller coaster of the experience and it's written for um, written for an everyday read and it's a fascinating account of how 
what a near miss this whole thing was. <coughs> so, some good news. If you look at um, this S&P uh, Financial Volatility Index, it's at the lowest level ever. So we've gone from a period of amazing volatility, lack of uh, concern about counterparty risk, to a, a, to, to a much, much more stable environment. You now have the situation where all the major OECD economies are growing together, albeit somewhat slowly. And across the OECD, you see output and employment above the, pe the peaks that were reached in 2007. So that's the kind of the good news. And the bad news is the, the extent of dislocation. I think something like 50% of, of youth in Spain are unemployed. Um, and you've got massive growth in public indebtedness in OECD countries that on average. Um, in New Zealand, it's true for New Zealand too, but we started from a much better place than most of our OECD counterparts, so we're a much better place than them too. And what, why that's important is that debt is kind of, yeah, governments can run up quite a lot of debt, but it's like, a, it's like taking out your shock absorbers in your car. Um, your ability to withstand future shocks is correspondingly reduced when your indebtedness level is up to the levels it is. I mean, you get someone like Japan, who, where their debt GDP ratio is getting up to 200%, and someone described the Japanese economy as a slow train wreck. So, how did that all affect little old New Zealand? Well, actually, not too bad. Um, so, that little picture is kind of this is um, world output weighted by our trading partners. So this is, this is how we went. So we had a bit of a blip. And you can see, you know, after the, the, the 90s, which were a period of the so-called great moderation, which had steep, really consistent and steady growth in world trade and in our trading partners, we got a bit of a blip and then we returned to trend. And uh, Jeff and I actually were part of a panel that, used, that reviews the Treasury's uh, macroeconomic forecast that were prepared period over this period. And, um, we were st I was struck by, as we went through commodity by commodity, product by product, service by service, um, in this period how New Zealand's outlook looked remarkably positive given um, the events that had happened. And what explains that? Well, one simple thing, China. Uh, this is uh, data for uh, 2012. So basically what it says is all our export, you know, exports grew quite well in that year. All of that was China. And Rob and I were talking before the um, lunch, and you know, if you think I've just chosen a year to make the point, actually if I'd used um, seven-year data, uh, the growth in exports to China would outweigh the loss elsewhere. So um, the, uh, the example I've used understates the effect of China. The second reason um, why New Z the other big factor that's influenced in New Zealand has been the overall stance of um, uh, monetary and fiscal policy. So the ne next graph gives you a long-term look at government financial, the f government financial balance. And the little red um, things at the bottom are the, the fiscal deficit on an accounting basis. So you can just see from the size of those red, we, we look, we've just gone through a period of the largest ever um, recorded deficits in New Zealand over a longer term time period. And um, in a funny way, and, and even if you took the Christchurch effect out, then the, the graph would basically look the same. It wouldn't, the peak wouldn't be as, as, as big, but it basically looked the same. So you have a period where the government um, leaned against um, the, the recession and um, uh, both in, sort of, in terms of its fiscal policy and also in terms of its monetary policy. Anyone who's bought a house recently will know what, what interest rates were like, so that's you know, a result of conscious monetary stance in New Zealand and in other jurisdictions. So we've had a, rece we've had a, a recession which has been quite unlike the others. So this graph plots the current recovery against previous recoveries. And so the current recovery is the bottom line. The shaded area is the range of previous recoveries. So t in a typical um, you know, recession in the um, in a historical period, you know, you had um, you had a bit of a kind of downturn, and you know, after about 15 months, you're back to where you were, and then the economy tended to rebound quite quickly. Indeed, there's some evidence that a small recession is good for you, good for the economy. It shakes out quite a large product, percentage of the productivity gains comes from shaking out inefficient firms. So there's some evidence to suggest that small recoveries are actually beneficial. 
This one, you can see, has been long and slow and protracted. And so we're way outside the, the bottom end of the, um, the range. Part of that is people have taken the opportunity to strengthen the balance sheets. So if you look at this as mapping GDP and credit growth, you can see that we've had a period of relatively slow GDP growth and very little credit growth, so that means you know, households are rebuilding their balance sheets and not borrowing the way that they were in the lead up to the GFC, and firms are taking the opportunity to pay off debt and strengthen their balance sheets. If you do look region by region, um, you, you see quite a few different New Zealands. One of my um, colleagues at NZIR is on the, actually um, live on NZIR Ask Me Questions right now. With his, he just released a book where he talks about zombie towns, uh, i.e. towns that if, you didn't, if they didn't exist, you wouldn't rebuild them. So you've had quite different experiences depending upon the region. Um, Christchurch, obviously, with the earthquake, re the, re the construction, Auckland, uh, Wellington at the bottom, and rest of New Zealand. But within that rest of New Zealand is quite different um, trends. Someone like Taranaki's done extremely well, way above Auckland in terms of employment and, and economic growth other areas struggling more. Similarly in terms of industries, a big, big shift in the industry mix, um, big boom in construction unsurprisingly given the Christchurch rebuild, but again you can see um, uh, both the, risk, the declines in individual industries and then the, the, the bounce back, so it's been spread across the board. So New Zealand's done by world standards, come through this reasonably well, we had the we didn't have the same um, banking crisis that other countries did, and Jeff might be talking to that a little bit. Um, but it's been a, a, a tough few years. So what does it all mean? Well, I think... Time? Yep. So I think there's three things in here. I mean, one is we're most probably looking at a period of lower future growth than, than before. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that um, the kind of permanent output growth that people were expecting is not going to come through because the stock of investment's less, because you've got had people withdrawn from the labour force, so that there's reductions in the kind of how people see the trend for OECD countries. I think politically, obviously, you're seeing huge pressures play out in Europe at the moment. The pressure on somewhere like Spain is, is horrendous. The pressure on the EU has been very strong. And I think, more generally, I think a, 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 we're most probably living through a period where you're seeing the end of the kind of dominance of the liberal Western view of the economy. If you do a bit of work in Asia, as I do, that's certainly the, the tone of the questioning that you get. So I think we're living through a period of change. And just like after the Great Depression, people didn't know what they were living through, I think we're going through that. Right, well, following on from that, um, I'll cover a wee bit more about what it might have meant to New Zealand and probably a bit of a bias from my agricultural background. But the uh, first slide coming up. Yeah. Yes, please. Oh, I can do it. Okay, got gotcha. you. Okay, first slide com coming up here. Um, just looking at these red dots up here, th these are the post average um, 2000. Um, interest rates by um, the central bank policies. And they're, they're a good guide where we're interested. So we're sitting up in New Zealand here, a bit, bit above 5%, and the US Federal Reserve there was about 25 just a shade under, say, 3% for practical purposes. We just roll forward to um, 2013, about this time. Last year it was 2.5%, uh, and the Federal Reserve down here was, was pretty low, and it's near enough to zero at the moment. So. We've moved from quite a high interest rate pre the financial crisis to all the central banks' adjustment of interest rates in order thumping down, down pretty low. Uh, interesting, a year ago the um, sort of markets were looking as, uh, at about 3.25% um, OCR rate, and we're probably around it, we are, are at that now. But that was a year ago how the uh, forward markets were looking at it. Um, they're just some sort of an idea to just put in perspective how much interest rates have come down. 
And one of the things is interest rates come down, uh, probably people start investing in, in different opportunities in a, in a different environment and an environment with lack of real confidence to do anything. As far as we're concerned in New Zealand, particularly in the export sector, the exchange rate's very important. So the Lehman Brothers failed about August 2008, and that's where the red line is the US dollar and currency sort of crashed around there, all sorts of things were leading up to that. And since then with lower um, interest rates, and particularly New Zealand, probably showing interest rates slightly higher, our currency has been marked up quite strongly, and it's really because other currencies are weak and the US dollars remain pretty weak. But that's pretty huge. So if we've got a, um, a rising trend in exchange rates on this index, that means imports like oil is becoming cheaper in terms of our currency and uh, exports that we sell overseas, we're getting less for them. So there's a sort of a double-edged sword on that exchange rate one. But that's really what's happened since, since the um, financial crisis. I think the other thing to note is we, we're part of a world economy, and this is global GDP growth, and it's quite interesting looking here at the, when the global financial crisis happened, how the U United States contributions to GDP, they went negative down here, and other rich countries, which is the lighter blue, which is larger Europe and Britain and such, is, is pretty low, and other emerging e economies also were impacted. But China was still staying out here positive. They had pretty, pretty strong growth. And then since that, the growth has moved here, coming up to 2010. The policies coming in that were um, to sort of stimulate economies and, and the impact, I guess, of low interest rates overall. Um, there has been some recovery. But the, the black here, United States, is pretty low underpinning from where it used to be if we looked at the graph much earlier. But look at, look at China, this, this dark bit here, how it's really grown all the way through here. That's been one of the big engines in, work, in the world growth. And that's been very beneficial to us. And also out of that, the emerging economies with lower interest rates, um, they started to fire along pretty well too, and the exchange rates. So global economy, uh, just that huge impact of China. And the, the, the next slide here is just really looking at um, China really <coughs> underpinned our export growth. And if we go back to 2007, 2008, about 6% of our export receipts were coming from China. And the global financial crisis happened here, though China was growing a wee bit in our export receipts. And then we had sort of dairy starting to take off, and then meat, and then forestry, and all these going through here. So now China is 17% of our export receipts for the year just ended. So huge, huge impact. So. We've gone from here, from 40 billion to 50 billion in export receipts here, with most of that, 8 billion of that's been underwritten by China. So the rest of the world, and particularly where we trade in my sector with, with meat, we've found some pretty appalling prices as the European economies haven't gone that well. It's been, been quite tough, in, and even in the, uh, the US. So a lot of that growth is just pushed us up, and that's been one of our reasons why I think New Zealand's got through pretty pretty safely. If we hadn't had that Chinese growth in coming our export market, I think we would have had a, a really, really sick economy and a huge depression here. That's my take on it. Um, and just to reinforce that, because we export most of what we produce, 90% of wool, 92% of lamb, most of our mutton, 80% of our beef, and about 96% or more of our, of our uh, dairy products, it's the exchange rate and overseas markets that drive uh, a lot of what we do back here in New Zealand, particularly in the private sector. Um, I don't really want to add much more. I, could, I think for the time, it's, I'm just going to detail about some of the meat prices. But Europe prices haven't fired too well, but our prices we've been getting out of Asia, North Asia, for our markets have, have held pretty well. Forestry's just come off the boil in the last eight months, and that's a bit of a real concern to the forestry industry back here. But um, I'll leave it at that, and I think I'll call on Jeff to wrap up. So uh, Derek and, and Rob have talked about uh, both the sort of depth of the crisis and the, uh, the sort of recovery from it through New Zealand's um, uh, successful trade with China. I'm going to talk a bit about the policy response. Um, uh, just uh, by way of, of, of scale, most of the finance company failures in New Zealand occurred before the, um, the financial crisis, but um, like about 30, 
30 of them occurred before August 08, but another 15 occurred um, from August 08 to um, the end of 11. So 45 uh, finance companies uh, failed. Um, and depositors lost about 1.5% of GDP. Um, about double that was actually impacted with, you know, on hold and moratoriums or, or whatever else. So, um, so, you know, we had our own mini financial sector um, crisis, but nothing on the scale of um, the others. Um, as Derek said, no banks failed here, though we did lend liquidity support um, to um, the banking sector and to individual banks uh, who needed, um, who were solvent but, but couldn't access financial markets adequately enough for the, to meet their short-term funding requirements. So uh, we were, you know, meeting that need. Uh, what, are, what have we learned? Uh, one of the big lessons is that large credit cycles, as Derek showed um, in, the, in that chart, which had the huge big um, peaks in private sector credit relative to, um, to GDP, um, big credit cycles can have big costs. They have big crashes. They go up. And when they go up, they leverage up activity, people borrow like mad, spend a lot of money, sometimes on real investments, real um, business investment, but also on housing and all sorts of things, and property development, commercial property. You get these big cycles, and then they can come to an abrupt end. And if you get a big enough one of those, you get in real trouble. Um, crisis can start in an unexpected place. People didn't expect it to start in the housing sector, albeit that... You know, over when people now do the analysis and look back, it's not unknown for them to start in housing sectors. It's just more often they start in commercial property or in uh, some other part of the um, investment um, area. Deep, um, even deep, deep financial markets, sovereign bond markets, etc., can freeze up um, in a crisis, and liquidity gets very, very hard. And then you get contagion effects. Somebody can't borrow to meet their needs, even if they look okay. Somebody else, they can't pay somebody else, they can't pay somebody else, and it ripples through, and you get these things. So both solvency and liquidity matter. Um, for the you know, non-economist, non-technical view, that solvency means that you actually could pay your bills if you had the money. You know, the, your, your ongoing proposition's okay. Liquidity is, have you, have you actually got access to the overdraft that you need at the time? And the other thing we learned is that public and private sector tend to get up, get very interdependent in a crisis like this. They need each other. Partly that's um, because the public sector stands behind so many financial institutions, either explicitly or implicitly. In the US, the biggest housing um, lenders were government-owned, um, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Um, um, so what's what's the international financial world been doing? Well, it's basic response has been to increase regulation, um, uh, to try and make the system safer. Um, and it's done that a number of ways. It's increased um, um, capital requirements um, on banks um, in particular. Um, notice I've got a page missing from my notes here, but I've got a page in the slides. Um, it's uh, also imposed some new liquidity requirements, so it's saying you've got to have a certain amount of your uh, funding um, uh, available at short-term notice. It's, there's been an increasing trend, which New Zealand partly has really led the way, but other countries, including Europe, are now adopting, which is to have special resolution mechanisms so that depositors actually end up paying uh, something to support the bank, and taxpayers don't do it all. Um, that's been pretty controversial, and you might, some of you might remember Cyprus did that in the heat of the moment, and everybody panicked and said, no, we can't do that. But now they're trying to pre-position so that you can uh, do some of this. Uh, we've introduced um, greater prudential regulation of the finance companies and insurance sector, which weren't regulated really strongly before. Um, enhanced stress testing of banks uh, to show that whether they can... Re withstand uh, problems. And um, and then there's been a new, um, I'll flip to this next page, um, new macro prudential policy regimes which are deliberately designed to try and attenuate big credit cycles. So the most popular instrument is loan to value restrictions. You know, when I say popular, uh, I mean wide, widely adopted, it's not really popular. Um, but it's a uh, 
Um, and this is a particular way of, of restricting high-risk household um, borrowing for, for, you know, for housing purposes. But it's one of a type of policies that is there to try and take the peaks off cycles, to stop them getting so high that they might crash. And we've introduced those um, as, of course, uh, October last year. So, um, yeah, that's, that's it. So uh, quite a significant regulatory response to try and make the financial system safer, with the, uh, the consequences, of course, of, of some costs of regulation uh, existing. Thank you.